Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through View 547. Today we're going to take a look at Innis, or I think it's pronounced Innish. So you can see here, it's got very kind of evocative uh, Celtic style art. Uh, this is a game from Matago Games, uh, brought over by Asmodee. Uh, this is a very interesting kind of game here. It sort of reminds me of a kind of a cross between Blood Rage and Kemet or something along those kind of lines, but it's very, very different than those actually. So it's a card drafting slash area control game with a very kind of unique way that the game will end. So uh, let's take a look at how the game works and also how the game actually looks, which is also very interesting. Uh, and then I'll tell you what I think about it. Okay, here you can see just about everything that you get in the game. The first thing to notice here as we zoom in here are these different area tiles. Uh, so these have different cool kind of like painted backgrounds. So there's an iron mine here. Uh, this one here is a misty lands. And you're going to set out uh, equal to the number of players uh, tiles randomly. Now the game does give you a sort of a learning setup. Uh, but you can just do this randomly as well. And you'll have a stack of these tiles, which may or may not come out during the game. And they have these kind of cool shape, but they're always going to be touching two other tiles, uh, at least when you put them in there. And they do actually fit uh, pretty well. Uh, the art on these is really cool. So you can see you've got the hills there, pretty cool. And then you have the, the plains there. And so what this is supposed to represent is kind of a uh, Ireland type of area, uh, North Ireland or the Ireland, the island of Ireland. And this is sort of when the Celts were settling this area here. Now one player is going to be the start player who is known as the, the Bren and this is the token that they will get. And every round they're going to flip this like a coin, which sometimes I'm good at and sometimes I'm not. <laughs> so you're going to flip that like a coin and this is going to tell you the direction of turn order, either clockwise or counterclockwise like that. And I'll just put that in front of them. And then players are going to draft cards. So before you do all that, you're going to have a little bit of a setup. A uh, start player is going to choose one place to get the capital citadel here, and this is just a special piece. They'll choose any of those, it doesn't matter which. And then players will take turns putting out one of their clans, and this each of these figures is known as a clan. It's sort of a, symbolizing each of them as a group. And you'll, until each of them have two. There's no real rules on how to place them out. You can see blue's all by himself here with orange and green there, and then each of the three players has a guy up there. Uh, and then you're going to draft cards. Oh, what's before you draft cards, you're going to see if anybody has a uh, control or basically they have the most figures in one of these spots. Now blue here has a misty lands, so they're going to grab here and put this in their hand, the misty lands card. And this is going to be a special card that they only they have. Uh, so if orange had, had another player here, uh, then they would have control of that because they've got more than everybody else. And then they would get the card here for the iron mine. So you can get cards by controlling these areas and at the beginning of the round you'll get the cards for those areas and again as more of these uh, areas come out then you'll go through this deck here and fish through and find you know whatever cards goes with the appropriate uh, location. Then you're going to draft cards and depending on the number of players you may remove some cards. So I've removed the four player cards from this case and you're going to shuffle these up. You're going to deal out four to each player and set one aside without looking at it and that's going to be in the hole and you may or may not get access to that card depending on different abilities. Now the cool thing about the drafting in this, each player is going to have four cards. So you're going to choose one and then pass three. And then you're going to get three from the next player depending again by the rotation here of the crow token which is the turn order token. And so I get three new cards and then I could choose two but I don't have to necessarily choose the one that I kept. I could say oh you know what I'm going to keep these two and then I'll pass those two. I get two from my right, and then I'm going to choose to keep three cards, and it could be in any combination. And so I can say, oh, maybe I'll keep this one from the last time, and then these two other cards, and then you get the final card, which you keep. And then you're going to go around and play the cards. And again, this is going to be starting with the Bren and going in the turn order depicted by that token there. And there's a couple of two types of cards. Let's see. You've got cards here with this symbol here, which is called a season. So this is a season card. This is something you can play as an action. And these green cards are known as the action cards. But you sometimes have cards that have a trigger effect here. And this means you will play it as a trigger. And you can see here, when an opponent plays an action card, then you can play this card in response to that. So if it's got that symbol, then you can play it you know, whenever it says on the card. Otherwise, you play this as your action. Now you can also get access to a sizable stack here of these epic tail cards. And these are just randomly shuffled up and then dealt off the top. And some of these action cards here will allow you to draw 
uh, new cards off this deck, and these are a little bit more powerful effects. And just while we're standing here, I don't usually do this, but I just want to show the artwork on here, which is just extraordinary, honestly. Uh, very well done, very differently illustrated, not your typical kind of, you know, airbrushed whatever type of look, uh, which is fine sometimes too, but uh, so that one is having a hard time focusing on that hair, I think. So that's a cool one there. Let's look at another one. This is a cool one, kind of a Zeus or Odin looking the fella. And here, Deidre's Beauty. And there's a sanctuary there. This is I could look at this all day, honestly. I could go through every card if you wanted. Nobody wants that. So one more. There we go. Maeve's Wealth. Okay, some cool art. So anyway, these are the epic cards that you can get, and these are especially powerful. Nobody knows what they are. However, this deck here of these green action cards is very noble uh, because, like say, in a uh, three-player game, you're only going to have the 13 cards in here uh, plus the one in the hole there. So every round, you're going to kind of know, okay, well, I haven't seen you know the new clans card come around, so that means Billy or Francesca has it. Uh, and you're going to start to know like when to time these cards and sort of like, depending on what state the game is in, when the cards are more or less useful. I'll talk about that more in a minute. So you're going to play those cards round after round, and you can pass on your turn. Now, if I pass, and then Billy and Francesca both pass, then the round's over. But if one of them takes an action, then I can get back in. Once you pass, you're not necessarily out of the round unless everybody passes in succession, and then the round is over. So what are some things that you can do? Well, some cards might allow you to add new tokens on the board or maybe you have you know add tokens in different ways some allow you to add these sanctuaries here and these are important for winning the game which i'll get to you might also add these citadels here which will be interesting in combat so there's different things that will do that you have the cards that will like counter other cards uh, just lots of different effects uh, you have cards that will let you look at this and add this to your hand and again you also have the effects here let's just take a look at misty lands here it says discard one or more action cards, it's the green cards, to draw that number of epic tail cards, choose one to keep and discard the rest. So it is worth noting that you do actually get to keep these round over round, whereas any green cards you didn't play will be shuffled back in and redrafted. And of course you need control of the areas to hang on to the yellow cards. Now, how do you win the game? Well, it's a very, very interesting way that the game will end. There's actually three victory conditions. And let's go over what those are. So the first way to win is if you have a location here that you control. So in this case, the blue player controls it because they have five uh, clan and the green and the orange each have three clan. So you control this area and your opponents total six. So in this case, we control it. And then the total of our opponents is actually six. So in this case, that would be one of the ways to trigger the victory condition and possibly end the game. So that's one of the three. The second one is to be in six different territories. So let's just lay out another territory here. And that just means you need to have presence. You just need to be in six different territories like that. So right now, blue's in four. One, two, three, four. If there was two more territories out here and they could spread out, then they're in six. So that is a victory condition, just being in six. Now the final one is being present with six or more sanctuaries. So here again is the sanctuary. And that just means you have to be in areas where uh, you have six. So there could be two in here, there could be one here, and then let's say there could be three up here. And that would be six for all, for frankly, uh, uh, just the blue player, because they've got that sixth one over here. So that's another way that you can trigger the end of the game. So the way that you do that is once you meet one of those victory conditions, or even go above and beyond it, you can take a pretender token for your action. So instead of playing a card, you take this and you say, okay, guess what guys, I've met this particular victory condition or multiple, if you meet multiple. And so you guys now have the rest of this round uh, to figure out how to beat me. And so it's kind of a way of passing your action and then you know, kind of painting a target on your back, so to speak, and then letting the rest of the game uh, progress. Now everybody can of course see what's going on so they'll know if you're close to a victory condition. Now, some of the cards will give you these deed tokens here, and there's a pile of these off to the side. These allow you to reduce the requirement by one. So let's take a look at this case here. Um, so there's now five of these sanctuaries out. Blue is within five of them. So if they had this deed token, then they could say, okay, this counts as my sixth sanctuary. Or if we had this condition back down here, uh, let's say there was no, there was only five other uh, figures here. So we had five and then we had control 
there aren't six other opponents, so this can act as that sixth opponent. So you can take a deed token uh, by playing a card. And so these will also persist, uh, you know, round over round. Whereas, let's say you took this pretender token, and then somebody did some action to remove one of your uh, characters or whatever, uh, then you will lose this at the end of the round. You have to get back to a victory condition and then retake it. Now, the next thing to talk about here is combat. So you can see there's kind of a shorthand on these cards here. And if it has this kind of war combat token, that will trigger combat. And this will happen by moving uh, figures in from another territory in this particular case. That's not always the case, but if it's got this combat icon, that means you're going to trigger a combat. Sometimes you can move in and not have a combat, or sometimes you could just be in a spot and trigger a combat without moving. So the way that that works is let's say, oh, I don't know, let's see, for argument's sake, uh, let's say green moves in here, and they're going to move in, and they're going to trigger a combat. So the way that this works is now starting to the left of green, whatever they are in turn order, each player has a chance to retreat, and that's where these citadels come in. So let's say orange is the next player, so they're okay, I'm going to retreat, put him in there, and now he is safe from combat. If there were multiple citadels in here, let's say it rotates back to blue, and blue's going to say, okay, my turn, I'm going to jump in here. And then if there was a, if it gets back to green, if there was another one, they could put one in there and so on, depending on how many citadels are in there. Then once we've all done that, you can have an immediate negotiation and say, you know what, let's just leave it as it is. You know, we'll let green in here. It's no big deal. Maybe orange lets them in here because they'll take control of blue or whatever, whatever the situation might be. And these guys would just simply jump back out and that would be it. But let's not do that. Let's have some combat. So if nobody agrees to or excuse me, if everybody doesn't agree to halt the combat, then green, since they initiated the combat, are going to get to do what's called a maneuver. So there's a couple of different things that you can do on a maneuver. One, you can attack. In that case, you're going to target one of your opponents, either orange or blue. Let's say we target blue, we're going to say, I'm going to attack you. So blue can do one of two things. They can remove one of their figures, or they can discard one of their green action cards instead of removing a figure. So green would get that attack action, then it would move to orange. Orange could do an action. So another action that you could do besides attack is actually to withdraw or retreat. Now, orange can move to an adjacent territory, but only if they have control. And when you have control, it's called a chieftain. So let's say orange was over here, there was two over there, and they had control. So orange would say, you know what, I'm out of here. That's my withdraw action. And now orange won't get to take any more actions because they don't have any more figures here, or the figures are hidden. So you can either attack or withdraw, but you can only withdraw to an area where you have control. You can't go to like a neutral area or something like that. Now the last thing you can do is you can play a card for a maneuver. And so sometimes these red cards here will have a maneuver. So let's take a look at this one here. This is the Fianna. It says during clash as a maneuver, then you can do this. Move one or more of your clans, either exposed or protected. And exposed means they're kind of out in the open. Protected means they're in there and says, uh, from the clashing territory to one adjacent territory, this does not initiate a clash. So I could say move, uh, let's say I didn't have this one here, I could play this as a maneuver like that and put him over there, and then maybe on a later thing I can then withdraw because now I've got the majority or something like that. So you can play these red cards here as a maneuver as well. And that's pretty much the gist of the game. You're just going to keep drafting these green cards round after round, distributing the yellow cards based on who has control, and then very keeping a close eye on the different victory conditions that are possible. Again, having control of a territory where you have six opponents, being in six areas, or being in areas where there are six total uh, sanctuaries. Okay, so that is Innis, and I gotta say, I love this game. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> it is a very quick, light, dudes on a map game. It's got the card drafting, which I love. It's got those three, uh, you know, victory conditions that you have to keep a close eye on at all times, even from early, early, early on in the game. But I have to preface it. I played it three times, and it's been a very mixed reaction uh, to the game. And, so, and I've talked to some other people that I haven't had a chance to play it with, and it seems very, very split uh, down that side as well. And I almost feel like I've talked to more people that didn't like it than do. But I think you have to kind of maybe go into this with a, a certain expectation, maybe, because there's one thing I love is card drafting. I like area control. Uh, the card drafting, you have to get used to because it's a fixed number of cards, depending on the player count. And I'll talk about player count in a minute, but 
you, it's very knowable what's what's in the game and what's possible. So as you learn that small deck of cards, you're going to know and realize what's important. Now there's a couple of cards in that small deck that are very key. One of those is the card that allows you to draw uh, those red epic tail cards. And these are the big fancy dandy, uh, you know, overpowered cards, if you will. So that card's key. You want to get that card. It doesn't really let you do anything on the board, but it gives you access maybe to something that's really cool. Now the second card is a card that allows you to sort of like counter spell. If somebody plays a green card, you can play that and you could counter it. And that is, it acts as like a kind of an anchor and a stranglehold on the game, but I think in a good way. So if you've ever played like Magic the Gathering or something, you know that sometimes you have to kind of play something that's kind of good, expecting it to be counterspelled. So then that's now out of the game, and then you can, uh, you know, play your thing that you really wanted to play after that. So I like that. That's a cool thing. That's one of the things I really liked about Magic was the timing aspect, once you kind of learn the meta. And this certainly has a meta uh, type of attitude to it, but it's a very small, noble metal. You got to play the game a couple times to kind of get to know it. Uh, and then you've also, of course, got the cards uh, from controlling the different areas, and those are going to be usually pretty good. Those will allow you to do all kinds of cool abilities, and the, the red cards are going to be cool. Uh, so I think folks will have a problem with the randomness of the red cards, um, but it's just something you got to you got to be prepared for, and you got to be prepared for uh, kind of sudden bursts towards a victory condition as well. Because I've seen the games last, gosh, I think it was a little over half an hour, but it was about a half an hour, and it was boom. Game was over, and, uh, you know, it was a bunch of new players at the table as well. Uh, but there's certain kind of, like, combos that you can put together, and you got to be very cognizant of that, especially based on some of the yellow cards that come out. You're like, okay, so that's going to allow them to actually dig through the card that was discarded or maybe a card that was already played that turn, you know, something like that. So they're going to be able to sort of fish out and kind of do multiple things more than what you would expect just given kind of the basic structure of the game. So I think you have to kind of go in and kind of learn that kind of stuff and have that kind of stuff happen. And then it becomes very like, it, very tense from the very first turn. Like there's no messing around in this game. And I think a first play is you're not going to know that. You're not going to, you're not going to really experience that. Uh, so it's going to be something kind of abrupt and random. But once you kind of know that and kind of go into that, it's like, okay, this I got to watch out because, you know, Billy's taking this card or that card or whatever. And it's really fun. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a great, excellent game. The artwork is outstanding. You know, you've got the sort of the paintings on the different tiles, uh, the different, uh, you know, Celtic style art. I guess it's Celtic style. It looks different to my American eyes. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this looks really cool. Um, but it plays quick, you know, you can you can have a game that maybe goes 90 minutes, uh, you know, maybe with four players where there's a lot of back and forth and gaining and losing uh, victory conditions, or you can have a game that goes 45 minutes. So you want to block out a little bit of time, but you can certainly have a quick, uh, deadly game. And it just has a good, like, I don't know, it's, it's like it feels more like an Ameritrash game than it does a Euro game, even though this is kind of a Euro game company. But these guys, the guys that made, you know, Kemet and Cyclades and all that kind of stuff, so it fits very much into that sort of vibe of that kind of game. But this is a much, like, quicker, it's not like a filler, uh, but, you know, it just it fits in, like a weird niche. It has the card drafting and area control, so it kind of feels like Blood Rage. It's got the kind of wonky end game, so that feels like Kemet a little bit. Um, but, yeah, it's just really neat, and it's just a fun way to explore. You'll have different, I don't know, these epic cards and the different uh, territories, which come along with their own different effects. So I will say, okay, the other last thing I want to talk about is player count. And I will say with two players, it's, it's like, okay, but you really want that third and the fourth player to have those interesting interactions in terms of the negotiation side of the combat. And that's another aspect I think that people kind of put people off was like, okay, that's a negotiation thing. So it kind of feels diplomacy, but the negotiation is just like in little moments. It's not like constantly throughout the game. Because once you sort of end the combat, or, you know, you, you kind of approach the combat in a situation where it's like, hey, I'm here, and now I've put you in such a position through my masterful and somewhat lucky card play, possibly, and now you're in a position that you have to let me in or else you're going to get destroyed. And But I'm going to maybe fight you back a little bit because now I know how, how much closer you're going to be to victory, so maybe you and I get kind of an agreement to work out. So it's it, But they're, they're just very discreet moments. It's not like a constant throughout the game, but you also have to be very aware of sort of the state of the game 
and make that kind of inform your decisions in terms of like where you move and when you attack and when you kind of bow out and let somebody in. So it's really cool. That really just spices up that game so much. Uh, but getting back to the point of two players, you kind of miss out on that. There's kind of cool, interesting card play and stuff like that, but that aspect of the game, I, it just kind of dissipates. Because uh, you get too like zero summy, you know, in that case. Um, but yeah, definitely recommend this for three and four players. I highly recommend it. Uh, one of the coolest looking games and just one of the most different, like precise games of this type. Okay, thanks.